Ciao everyone and welcome back to Growth Talks. I am Raf, your host, and my guest today is David Mirman Scott. Hi David, how are you doing? Hey, ciao back to you. How's it going, Raf? <laughs> <laughs> I'm very good, actually, and, and very excited about this uh, this this episode. So good, a huge so fan of your of your work. Uh, as I told you when I, I reached you for this um, you know for this uh, episode here, uh, I I really loved your books. Uh, oh, thank you. <laughs> this one is this one is here. Uh, very on, kind on the of library. you. Library. So yeah, super excited about it. Um, we usually start this conversation, uh, you know, with a um, a simple one with a with a classic question. So. Uh, who's David? Uh, what's what's your story? What's my story? Um, I thought I wanted to be a bond trader, so I worked on Wall Street for a couple of years. I hated it. Um, I really, really was not for me. But I loved the information that bond traders used, um, and so I spent the first part of my career, about ten years, working for companies like Dow Jones and Reuters. Um, and I worked outside the U.S. I was in Asia for ten years. Um, Tokyo and Hong Kong. Um, and then in 2002, I started my own thing. And I started to initially do some consulting, but then I've I've written 13 books since then, um, have delivered presentations all over the world. My books are in 30 languages. I've delivered presentations in more than 40 countries. Um, and what I'm up to now is really focusing on the idea, as you know, because you just held the book up, about fandom and how and why people become fans of something and how that can be an interesting way of framing the way that a company does marketing, a way an individual does marketing. Um, and it's super exciting for me to be able to do that. Just um, last week, in fact, I was in Seoul, South Korea, um, speaking at a conference that was organized by the government of Korea about fandom, because as you may know, Korean culture has become huge. Um, the number one show on Netflix, Squid Game, uh, K-pop, um, pop music, Korean pop music, super popular, Korean movies, super popular. Um, so um, the Korean government organized this event to talk about fandom, and I was the the keynote speaker, so it was super cool. And I, I and I love this idea of how and why people become fans of something. Wow, um, thirteen books—that's that's a lot. Uh, <laughs> and I remember I was a kid when I started with your first one. <laughs> and, <laughs> and you were you were with me, you know, uh, for the whole journey. So. Oh, that's I, that's I kind of question. kind of you, I, kind of you to say so. Yeah, that's been. Um, I guess that's been sixteen years now. Yeah. yeah. Wow! Wow! Amazing! I love it. Um, I have a few questions about this one, and I sure. want to start. You know, uh, I remember that when I I bought uh, this one it was uh, a few years ago. I don't remember now, but uh, you know, there was the title "Phonocracy," but you know, the, the 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 second part of the title, so the subtitle was the the part that really uh, triggered something in me. So it, it's turning fans into customers and customers into fans. And what I thought uh, back in the days, and what I want to ask you is that usually, you know, companies and, and businesses, small and, and big ones, they only think about the first part, you know, turning yeah. fans into customers. So we have, I don't know, followers on Twitter, you know, on Instagram, on YouTube, and we want them to buy products and services from us. What do you mean by, you know, turning customers into funds? Uh, that's for me the interesting part. Okay, cool. So um, I'll answer that in a second, but we spent a lot of time trying to figure out that title. Um, uh, I, as you know, I wrote the book with my daughter, um, Reiko. And, uh, and so we wanted a title and we ended up with fanocracy that had the word fan in it that I could own the URL that could be a word that I put into the lexicon of marketers and business and, and entrepreneurs and so on. So that, that took six months. <laughs> we looked at a lot of different titles and then I had, we had no clue about a good subtitle. And it was, it was eventually our publisher who suggested the subtitle. And as soon as we heard it, it's like, yeah, that's it. That's perfect. So the idea of turning customers into fans, is when you have a human relationship with your existing customers, um, you're developing that fandom, you're, you're, you're engaging with 
customers in a way that most companies do not. Most companies treat you as a number. Uh, you know, your customer number and, you know, you're just like any other customer. And people then um, treat the companies that they do business with as interchangeable. You know, if it doesn't matter to you what airline you fly, if it doesn't matter to you what hotel you stay in, if it doesn't matter to you um, uh, what kind of um, technology product you buy, you're going to go with the cheapest or you're going to go with what's considered the best quality. You're not going to go to the one that you're a fan of. And it, and it means that you don't have any loyalty within your business. Um, and, you know, the, 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 the opening story in the book, it's actually, actually not the opening story, but the opening big um, case study that we share is an insurance company. They're called Haggerty. And they do classic car auto insurance. And what's interesting to me about this is that sometimes people push back and they say, okay, David, fine. You know, if I'm running a restaurant, I have fans. If I'm a musician, I have fans. But we're a software company. We don't have fans. Or, or, or we're an insurance company. We don't have fans. I mean, people are constantly making excuses for the fact that, no, I don't, I don't want to have fans. I, I don't, I'm not running an organization that has fans. So Haggerty is an insurance company. They do car insurance and they have literally millions of fans because they've organized their whole business around that second part of the subtitle, turning customers into fans. Um, they have a driver's club with over a million members. And when you're a member of the driver's club, you have access to all of their data on how much classic cars are worth because Haggerty insures these classic cars. So they know how much all of these different cars are worth. Um, they have, um, they go to classic car shows and they're there with a booth um, where you can go and spend time with Haggerty. They just do a lot of different things. They have a magazine that comes out six times a year. They're doing a lot of things to have, to turn customers into fans. Now, what this means is when you're a fan of Haggerty, you won't leave. You won't go to another insurance company that says, hey, we're going to insure your car just like Haggerty and we're 10% cheaper. Most people aren't going to do that. They're going to stick with the company that they are a fan of. And in fact, um, I'm a customer of Haggerty. I have a 1973 Land Rover. It's been insured by Haggerty for more than 10 years. And just yesterday, another insurance company approached me and said, hey, we can do your car. We'll do it cheaper. And I no, I'm sticking with Haggerty. Uh, and I had an opportunity to interview Mikhail Haggerty, who's the CEO of, uh, of Haggerty Insurance, helped found the company. And he told me that, you know, this is how we, we, we build our business, David. It's totally based on fandom. It's not based on, you know, we're not the cheapest. Uh, we don't spend more money on advertising than the other guys, but we have more fans. And in fact, they're the largest now classic car auto insurance company in the world. And they just went public um, a, a couple of years ago on the New York Stock Exchange. So they're doing really, really well, all based on this idea of building fans. Uh I love when you said that, you know, sometimes companies, they always have an excuse. Uh, so they say, oh, no, no, you know, my company is different. Uh, my, I don't know, my industry is different. Uh, right. So, yeah, that's cool, but we can't do that. <laughs> yes, exactly. What, happens all the you, time. How do you reply to someone that says that? And what's the first step? So if you want to really make them understand that they can actually do that, they can build a fandom. How I am. Um, I, I always I always come back to examples. I love, love, love sharing examples of people who have built fans in. If I have an example in the industry that the person's in, I might cite that one. Um, and so when I talk about auto, auto insurance, I say to people, do you love car insurance? And nobody says yes. I mean, it's a terrible product, right? You have to spend money on car insurance. It's expensive. You know, in this country, it's several thousand dollars a year to insure your car. So it's no fun to pay that money. Furthermore, you never want to use the product because it means you crashed your car. What a terrible product, right? And if Haggerty, an insurance company, 
can develop millions of fans. Well, there's proof right there. The other thing I like to suggest is that um, uh, uh, we found a, a U.S. government agency that has nearly that has a hundred million fans. It's NASA. And what's interesting about NASA, they are literally part of the U.S. government. Um, most people are like, the government has fans? What are you talking about? But yeah, um, there's uh, nearly 100 million followers of NASA's Instagram. People wear NASA t-shirts. I mean, it's super interesting that people are fans of NASA. Um, and I have one more example to share about this idea of anybody can create fans. I, um, I, I speak at Tony Robbins Business Mastery events around the world. And I was speaking at an event several years ago and a dentist came up to me. He's a dentist in Southern California. His name is Dr. John Marashi. And Dr. Marashi said to me, David, I just heard your speech about fandom and I understand this idea of fandom, but I'm a dentist. What are you talking about? How can I have fans? You know, people just come to the dentist, get their teeth cleaned. You know, why would they become a fan? And I said, well, Dr. Marashi, most dentists, and in fact, because you do it, most um, clients of dentists will think of a dentist as uh, a commodity. You know, one dentist and the other one down the street are essentially the same. But what makes you different? What are you passionate about? What are the things that you love to do? Maybe we can make you stand out as a unique dentist. And now he practices in Southern California, and there's you know 10,000 10, or more dentists in Southern California. And so he said to me, David, I love to skateboard. And I'm like, oh, well, that's cool. Let's, let's figure out how we can share your love of skateboarding within your dental practice. So, um, so what Dr. Marashi did after we spoke about this after my talk was he put skateboards on the wall. You know, here, I've got a surfboard on my wall. He's got skateboards on his wall in his dental practice. Sometimes he'll skateboard from one examination room to another. He never, he's never on a skateboard when he actually does dentistry, but he, he will skateboard from one uh, office to another. Um, he then has an Instagram uh, with, um, last time I checked, I think it was over 30 million followers for a dentist. And he shares um, skateboarding videos and skateboarding photographs. Um, he's got on his website pictures of him skateboarding. So now he's completely um, changed the way that dentists communicate because most dentists, it's all about, hey, you know, I'm a professional. Here's where I went to school. And, you know, that's it. But Dr. Marashi is, yeah, I'm a dentist, but I'm also, I love to skateboard. And skateboarding is a very important part of my life. And you walk into the office, there's skateboards. You see their website, there's skateboards and him skateboarding. And his Instagram is him skateboarding. Uh, about a year after we had that discussion and he implemented these ideas, he reached out to me and said, David, you're not going to believe this, but uh, I've had a 30% growth in new patients wow. and a 23% growth in revenue in my business that I can attribute every one of those percentages to the idea that I just shared that I have, that I love to skateboard. And it's because people become a fan of the dentist who's passionate about skateboarding. And, and it's not because they are a skateboarder. It's because they're passionate. Um, they, they recognize his passion for skateboarding. And then if somebody says, hey, who's your dentist? I'm thinking about changing dentists. They, oh, my God, my guy's great. He's a skateboarder. Check him out, Dr. John Marashi. Um, so check out his Instagram if, if you want to see how that's done. But turning customers into fans, and in this case, turning fans into customers. It's super cool. Wow. Uh, so what would you say are like the... Uh, first steps. So if there is, you know, any business owner listening to this episode and they say, oh, this is cool. Uh, I'm a dentist or, you know, something similar. And I always thought that that was impossible for me, but now I know that I can actually do. Uh, what are the first steps? Maybe the first one uh, is trying to be unique or something. Um, like that. Be, um, before you even do that, I would get rid of everything 
on your website and in your social media that's generic. So what I mean by that is if you're using stock photos on your website, get rid of them. If you're using the same language as everybody else, get rid of it. You know, many people, um, when they describe their company in English, if they're a technology company, use words like uh, flexible, scalable, cutting edge, mission critical, innovative, comp uh, words like that. Whatever language your website is in, eliminate the words that everybody uses and rather speak in the way that um, your buyers speak, that if you want to build fans, speak in the way that your fans speak and write in the ways that your fans would read um, and uh, and get rid of that stock, those stock photographs or any stock videos because you don't want to be seen as generic. So that's the first step. And you can literally do that today. You know, you can finish this, uh, this podcast, um, uh, close the podcast app, and then all of a sudden you can uh, get rid of the generic stuff on your website. Um, in the case of Dr. John Marashi, he shares what he's passionate about. And I'm doing that now. I've got a Grateful Dead logo over my right shoulder. If you're watching on video, you can see it if you're only listening. Um, it's a um, uh, it's a big logo over my shoulder. I love the band, The Grateful Dead. I've seen them 98 times. I wrote a book called Marketing Lessons from the Grateful Dead. So I'm proud to share right here, right now, that I'm a fan of The Grateful Dead. I've also got a surfboard that I built myself at a, at a company called Grain Surfboards. Huge fan of what Grain Surfboards is doing. Um, I love to surf and I love to share the passion for my surfing. So I'm sharing the things I love. How can you share what you're passionate about? Or if there's many people in your organization, how can you show their humanity by showcasing what they're passionate about? And then, and you could start doing that like, like Dr. Rashi did. Then be thinking about the kind of content that you can create and push out there that will be valuable to the people you're trying to reach and can help them to become your fan. And I mentioned Haggerty earlier, but they've got a YouTube channel with over a million subscribers. They've got a magazine that comes out six times a year. They have a database of values of classic cars that you can look at if you become a member of the Haggerty Drivers Club. So they've focused on this idea of what kind of content can we create, video, written content, data, that will help to, to grow fans. So that would be another step to think about. But what it all comes down to, if you, if you make it, um, uh, what are all of the, these things have in common? It's bringing a humanity to what you do. It's, it's, it's recognizing that people want to do business with people rather than people want to do business with just a, a, a technology number or something. So that's what it comes down to. How can you humanize what you do? If you are enjoying this episode, please check out my lead generation course. You can watch it for free on gaito.link slash Skillshare, G-A-I-T-O. As an entrepreneur, marketer, or business owner, you know how crucial lead generation is. In this course, I'll be sharing with you 20 proven tactics for lead generation in both B2B and B2C markets. You can watch it for free on gaito.link slash Skillshare, G-A-I-T-O. You'll find the link in the description. And have you, have you seen any, uh, let's say, uh, common mistakes that, you know, small business or big companies, uh, they do when they try to start, you know, um, uh, this process, something that everyone is like, you know, this is a classic mistake and how to avoid it. Yeah, the biggest mistake I see, and I've seen it for 20 years, it happens all the time, every single day I see examples of this, is only talking about your products and services. Um, I don't know what it is with entrepreneurs or marketing people or salespeople, but they tend to default to product. You know, here's what I do. Here's my product. Um, and, you know, whatever it might be. You know, you're a dentist. Oh, I can con I can clean your teeth. I can I can I, I can I can fix your teeth. Um, that's the product. But you need to go to the next step. And so the biggest mistake is uh, is talking way too much about your product or your service because ultimately people don't care about your product or service what they care about are themselves and solving their problems so that's what you need to focus on
Mm. Yeah, I love it. Um, I have a few notes here, a couple of questions that uh, I have for you. Um, uh, let me find one was at the beginning. All right, no problem. Um, so there is this great example. Um, the the company is called uh, Brookline uh, Booksmith. Um, and you say, um, instead of just selling the product books, in their case, uh, they serve as a hub of its local community, uh, facilitating, you know, discussions around book and, you know, uh, whatever, uh, blah, 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 everything else. Uh, and I was thinking, you know, when I, I was reading this part here, that, uh, for example, this is uh, an industry where everyone is scared of, you know, Amazon because Amazon is the big one. So it's right. impossible to compete with Amazon. But you actually show that there is a way to compete and it's not, you know, competing on the price, but it's on something different, the building the experience, not the, 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 the community and, right. and everything else. Uh, can you tell us uh, a little bit more about this idea? Sure. Yeah, sure. So Brookline Booksmith is a bookstore located in um, uh, one of the neighborhoods of Boston near where I live. And um, they've got a big bookstore um, that's physically located in the hub of this community. And there's restaurants nearby. There's coffee shops nearby. Um, and so there's a lot of people who walk around this particular neighborhood and many of them uh, will go into Brookline Booksmith just to take a look around. So they've organized it as a place that you can go and just and just browse and just take a look. Um, the people who work there are extremely knowledgeable about books, and um, you can um, you know you can ask suggestions of them um, that you you can't really get with something like Amazon. Um, uh, you can get the algorithmic suggestions from Amazon, but not talking to a real person. So that's a big difference. They have um, some, more than 200 book events every year. Um, and we launched Fanocracy actually in Brookline Booksmith during uh, an event that we held there. Um, and people love to go and meet the author of, uh, of a book that, of, of books that they love. Um, and so these are big, can be really big events with really famous authors or small events with, um, with a niche author. And, and so they do a great job of bringing the community get together around those events. And then something that to me is quite remarkable is that, you know, building on this community aspect of what Brookline Booksmith does is that they've got um, the room where they hold their uh, events. It's in the basement of the bookstore. They allow book clubs to use the space for free. Um, and those book clubs have no affiliation with Brookline Booksmith. They're just allowing a book club, uh, you know, book lovers getting together to talk about a book to use the space. They don't even have to buy the book that they're discussing from Brookline Booksmith. They could buy it at Amazon, bring it in. That's fine. They're providing that space. So essentially what they've done is they've looked at Amazon and said, what are the things Amazon does? Well, they'll deliver a book. It's, it's a low price. And they said, let's do the opposite. Let's make a community, a physical place you can go and do everything we can to build that physical community. And mean, meantime, when other bookstores have tended to be closing over the years or since Amazon has risen in, 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 in its power, Brookline Booksmith is actually expanding and having great years as they're um, as they're doing this this way of building fans. This is a powerful idea. Do you think that it can be somehow you know uh, used in, in in you know in different contexts in different industries? So if I work in a different industry and in my industry there is like a huge a big company you know the the main competitor that everyone is scared of. Uh, do you think this idea can work also in a different context or in a different industry? Um, I do. I think one of the things that they've hit on is this idea of proximity between people. And that's actually something that um, my daughter and I, my co-author in the book Fanocracy, my daughter and I did a bunch of research on. We spoke with neuroscientists about this idea that we humans like to be in close proximity nearby other humans, uh, especially if they're part of a group of people that we like. 
um, that that's super a super powerful idea of bringing people together like-minded people to share in something. So what the Brookline Booksmith understood, they maybe, maybe they didn't understand the neuroscience behind it, but what they understood is if you bring people together for book events, if you bring people together to share a love of books, if you bring people together who are part of book clubs, those human connections, one person to another, are super powerful. And then people remember, oh, I had that connection at Brookline Booksmith. Um, and so they have very positive feelings of that particular location um, and will want to go back to have more of those human connections. So any business can be thinking about how can I bring people together physically so that they're literally able to talk with one another, be near one another, to be, sh to be able to share a like-minded experience. Another example of this idea, um, a company um, that I've been associated with now for I think 17 years is HubSpot. So uh, HubSpot is a sales, marketing and customer services um, technology company. Um, and they, they provide CRM style systems that help companies to grow their businesses. And I joined their advisory board way back in 2007 when um, when HubSpot was only um, a handful of people and and only a quarter of a million dollars in revenue, and I've been advising them and part of their advisory board since then. And now they've they're they're going to generate something like two and a half billion dollars um, in the next year, um, and they have seven thousand employees. They're growing like crazy. And what HubSpot does is they have an annual conference. Uh, it's held in Boston. Um, and um, this past year, they had, uh, I think it was 12,000 people in person and then 100,000 people virtually. But that in-person group of 12,000 people, plus they have much smaller events in other parts of the world, they have offices uh, in many different countries, um, bringing those people together who are customers of HubSpot or who are fans of, of HubSpot, but not yet customers, bringing them together into a conference where they can meet one another and share ideas physically in person, super, super great way to build fans. Um, so anything that you're, you can do, whatever kind of business you run, if you can bring people physically together so that they're in the same room is a super powerful way to build fans. And how important is the physical aspect of it? Uh, I mean, uh, now, you know, everyone is talking about metaverse in the last couple of, of, of years. Uh, is this something, is it, is it a good uh, alternative or it's important that they have to be physically in the same room, uh, you know, close to each other when this happens? Um, it, physically in the same room is super, super powerful. So if you have a way to do that, it's important to try to do it. There are alternatives, like we're doing one right now, video. Video can be an alternative. Um, and it goes back to another form of neuro neuroscience. It's called mirror neurons. I'll demonstrate this idea for you right now. So mirror neurons are the part of our brain which fires when we see somebody do something and our brain is firing as if we're doing it ourselves, So this is an important concept to understand around the idea of having a virtual connection with fans. So remember that having a physical connection in the same room uh, is the best. But if you can't have a physical connection, having a virtual connection on video, it can be super powerful. So let me demonstrate the idea of mirror neurons. When my brain fires, I feel it big time. However, if you see somebody do something, your brain can fire too. I've got a lemon and I've got a slice of lemon. If I take a bite of the slice of lemon, wow, um, super powerful. My eyes close. My, I can feel the lemon on my tongue and on my lips. And wow, it's really powerful to bite into a lemon. Raph, are you feeling the lemon too? <laughs> yeah. <Totally. laughs> Isn't that weird? Right. So that's mirror neurons. So where it becomes valuable 
um, for building fans is doing exactly what we're doing right now. By having video where you're looking directly at the camera like we're like we're doing now, and it's cropped as if you are nearby somebody. Like I'm standing right now. So my video is cropped as if we're having a conversation standing up, um, you know, maybe at a party or something. Uh, I, I think you're sitting down. Is that right? Yeah. 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 So when, when you're sitting down like you are, and you've cropped in the, a perfect way. Um, it's like you're sitting across from somebody at a restaurant or a bar. And our brain, because of mirror neurons, I showed you the example of the lemon. And those of you who are only listening, um, I held up a lemon. And maybe even your mouth is tasting a lemon too. And you didn't even see it. You just heard me talking about it. Um, but your brain began to fire too. So now when you're seeing video like we're doing right now on video. And if you're not watching, both of the videos are, I mean, you're, you're not watching on video, just listening to both of the videos are cropped as if you are in the same room with me and Raf, is that um, our brains process as we're literally in the same room. Now, intellectually, you know, you're not in the same room as that person. They're on video, but your brain processes it as if you are. And this is exactly why you feel as though you personally know a movie star or an actor because you've seen them on TV. Your brain thinks that you are friends um, with that person. Um, so long way of saying if you cannot get your customers into the same phys physical room, maybe you can use video, create a video podcast, interview customers, and share it on a YouTube channel or another video channel. Put video on your website, even photographs, put them on your website. Cropped as if you're in the same room, casually shot, looking directly at the camera, exactly like we're creating right now. So you're building fans, Raf, by just by doing this, <laughs> this, this uh, the growth talks that you're putting together, you're building fans. Um, I, have a, I have another one from, uh, from the book. Uh, you know, there are a lot of, good example, but there is also, let's say, um, uh, a bad example. And it's the one about, you know, uh, there was this statement from uh, Adobe Photoshop. Um, so, you know, the, the way uh, people could use the brand and the way uh, they was not allowed to use the, the brand. And what's yeah. interesting here is the fact that, you know, um, I'm reading from the book. So every incorrect statement sounds like a fan of Adobe Photoshop software, while every correct statement sounds like a robot. And this is yeah. so true. And yeah. all and and it's so common. I mean, it's a very common mistake. Um, how can we avoid that? So uh, where the the reason that this happened is that the branding people at Adobe makers of Photoshop and other, other software products, um, were trying to control the way that their customers talk about their products and services. And they were saying, you can say it this way, but not this way. That's a big mistake because what we learned as we did a bunch of research about fandom, and I keep saying we, my daughter wrote the book with me, is that, um, if once you put your product or service or art out there, it no longer belongs to you. It now belongs to your fans. And you need to let go of your creations. You need to understand that if a fan wants to talk about you in their own words, that should be great. You should let that happen. And don't try to control that conversation. Because if you're trying to control that conversation, you're going to um, you're going to to actually put brakes on the idea of fandom, and people will be less likely to be your fans because you're trying to dictate to them what they can and can't do. So uh, Adobe kind of screwed that one up. Um, they actively discouraged people from talking about uh, Photoshop um, in the way they wanted to and tried to control the message, and then people get frustrated and they won't talk about you. Uh, or they'll say negative things about you. Um, 
So, you know, let people share in the way they want to share. I love it. Uh, this is a very powerful idea. Yeah, I love it. Uh, David, we usually end these conversations here on the podcast uh, with two uh, quick questions. So if you have any um, cool books that you want to share with us, of course, uh, your book is going to be linked in the description below. Thank you. But have you read something in the last couple of, I don't know, uh, years, something that was really, uh, I don't know, uh, a, a good book that you want to share with my, my audience, uh, something marketing related, but also, I don't know, a novel or whatever. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm, I really like to learn about, um, ideas that I can apply to marketing, but from different industries. Um, I, I read very few marketing books, very few business books. I tend to read books from other industries and apply it to marketing. So a, a great example of a book like that is by David Byrne. And David Byrne is the lead um, uh, singer of the Talking Heads rock band. And he has a book called How Music Works. Mm. And How Music Works is a great overview of, um, uh, uh, of his career Um, but also music going all the way back to um, the Middle Ages. And uh, I found it super interesting as a way to learn about music uh, as a non-musician um, that can then, I can apply some of those ideas to marketing. Nice. Uh, you'll find the link in the description as well of this one. Um, and what about uh, tools? Do you have any um, useful and cool tool that you use in your day-to-day -day, uh, routine, in your job, something that you want to share with us? Sure. Um, a, a tool I really like is called Lately, Lately.ai. Um, and Lately.ai is a software tool where I can take long form content that I create and instantly turn it into short form content, which then I can share on my social networks. So specifically the way it, will, it works is I can take a, a chapter of Fanocracy, for example, or I can take a blog post that I've written, drop it into Lately, and then Lately will create 10 or 20 or 30 uh, LinkedIn posts or tweets. And then I can schedule those through Lately to go out once a day or you know, one, twice a week or whatever schedule I want automatically be shared. So um, it saves me a ton of time and increases the number of social posts that I do. And, and critically important, it's my content. You know, I'm not, it's not like ChatGPT making something up. It's literally my content turning long form content into short form content lately AI. Great. I love it. Uh, and lastly, do you want to share with us where they can find you, read you, follow you? Any links? Absolutely. So we've got a great website at fanocracy.com. If you want to learn more about that book, um, uh, I've got a website, davidmearmanscott.com. And then most of the social networks, I am uh, DM Scott, D M S C O T T. Cool. Great. Uh, every link is going to be in the description uh, below. David, thank you very much for your time. This was great. my pleasure. Thanks, Raf. Good to talk to thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of the podcast. I hope you enjoyed it and you learned something new. Make sure to subscribe to us on YouTube and Spotify to stay updated on new episodes. With your support, I can continue to bring great content and great guests to this podcast. So hit the subscribe button now and I'll see you in the next episode.